How's everybody doing today? Are you, yeah, green, red, what are, how are you feeling? Green, red, yeah, great. Um, I'm feeling green. Um, democracy and climate justice, maybe not so much. Uh, so I want to just get right into it. Uh, my family is from Pakistan, and as we know, a third of the nation was just underwater. And I was there just a month ago for a whole month. And while I was there, we saw the former prime minister of the country arrested, as well as seeing the government itself dissolve. Meanwhile, myself, who I'm American, and in the United States, democracy is not doing so hot either. In the past year, we have seen over 300 bills being introduced by a majority of states that actively suppress votes of the people. At the same time, just a few years ago, we had a massive insurrection, a coup at the capital of the United States on the day where we are meant to see a peaceful transition of power. We saw anything but that. And now what we see, if you go online, is a viral mugshot of our former president. The Washington Post says that democracy dies in darkness, but it kind of seems like it's dying right now in broad daylight. I believe that there is a fundamental connection between climate change and democracy. In many of the same nations where we see issues of democracy, we also see a fundamental inability to tackle the issues of the climate crisis. There will be no climate action without functioning democracies, and there is no functioning democracy in the context of the climate crisis. I mean, if we look right now at Pakistan, I mentioned the floods that are happening. We're also seeing rampant issues when it comes to scarcity of water. We are seeing issues with intensifying monsoon rains. When we look here at the United States, Hawaii on fire, California on fire, Canada on fire, with that smoke coming here, turning New York City orange, it's essential that we work on climate, and that's what I've been doing throughout my life. I started my work in the environmental movement when I was just 12 out on Long Island where I grew up. I've since had the opportunity to be an expert reviewer on the IPCC, uh, do climate research out in India, in Darjeeling, and work as a consultant to the UN. And I want to share a particular anecdote of one time when I was here at the United Nations. I had just given a talk at the building over there, and after I had spoken about our need to take climate action, an ambassador from a country who will remain unnamed came up to me and said, okay, kid from America, nice for you to come here and tell us all, all these things we need to do on climate action. What are you doing? What is your country doing? And so then I started to reflect, what am I doing? What is our country doing? What is every country doing? And how can I change what I do to fundamentally impact that. It's nice to have and essential to have all of these large scale global policies. But if we don't have momentum and movement on the ground, they're not gonna happen. And at the same time, I had another conversation with someone, a fancy political consultant who was just casually giving me some advice. And she said to me that, I don't know why you would link climate action and democracy. Young people don't vote and people don't vote based on climate. And when she said that, I took that personally. And I thought, I think you're wrong. I think that we're fundamentally missing this intersection. And so I took matters into my own hands. I started organizing campaigns on the ground and online, coming together with a bunch of my friends. What we did instantly went viral. We had people connecting to their friends, essentially young people, bringing other young people directly into the movement. We see so much disengagement from older political figures who do think that young people don't vote. But once we started actually activating that ground base, we had over 300,000 people putting the word vote on their face through Instagram. We had thousands of people sending selfies of themselves at the polls with their plus ones, their friends, who they brought with them out, doubling their impact fundamentally in our democracy. And as a result, we have seen in the last few years a drastic shift in how we talk about climate and climate action in the United States. I recently published a Yale study in which we found that while only 1% of uh, Americans are actively participating in campaigns in environmental justice, over 25% are willing to. 
What that says to me is there is enormous growth potential when it comes to climate action. What we need to do is we need to continue to grow this space. We need to continue to organize and mobilize. We cannot listen to what we're told is politically possible. We cannot look at what was as an indication of what can be, because the fact of the matter is we have never solved the climate crisis. And if we are going to solve the climate crisis, we have to envision a new future. That's what makes a visionary. And if we want to do that, yeah, exactly, exactly, give it up for that. If we want to beat this fundamental issue of climate collapse, if we want our democratic institutions to continue to remain and to thrive, it is up for us to go from moment to movement, movement to momentum, vote to policy to politician, to fundamental change of what we believe is possible. And so, are you ready to get out and vote with me? Thank you, everybody. I will be back shortly, but I'm so happy to have had your attention. And up next, I'm going to introduce our amazing panelist, uh, our amazing panel, which will be moderated by Dieter uh, Wagner, who is from the UN Office of Partnerships. So I'll see you in a little bit. And make a round of applause for our incredible panel that is coming right now.